Okay, welcome back, everybody. Let me continue with the second part. I want to, well, first of all, I was too slow in the first part. So in the second part, I wanted to talk in quite some detail, or like in the, the second part of the first lecture, I wanted to talk in quite some detail about uh, how to use this IMPS or how to use DMRG to extract fingerprints of uh, topological order. Uh, now, I just uh, decided to just basically give a very brief idea how this can be done, and uh, then uh, you can look at some more literature, also some of the notes that I wrote, where there's uh, more, more detail on this topic. So let me just give you some the basic ideas of what I mean by this. So with the last part where we um, stopped, we just looked at the uh, transverse field Ising model. And there, I hope that I could show it's a very easy to, or like a very, very easy to use uh, infinite matrix product states to extract uh, relevant information. So, in particular, we could just calculate the magnetization or the spontaneous symmetry breaking to distinguish the ordered and the disordered um, uh, phase. And that clearly, I mean, done there for the simplest model, also applies for much more complicated models. So, if you just have some uh, uh, spin or like some some Hubbard type model you will be able to actually identify uh, kind of breaking of translation symmetry, of uh, um, spatial symmetries, of uh, rotation, spin rotation, or whatever symmetries you, you could think of, you can just check if they were broken or not. However, there is like a different class of uh, phases of matter for which this will not work. So there are well-defined kind of quantum phases of matter that cannot be distinguished by measuring any uh, local order parameter uh, so, so you cannot identify these phases um, by by local measurements. So, and the kind of prominent examples are the, the quantum Hall effects, both the integer quantum Hall effect and also the fractional quantum Hall effect, so-called spin liquids uh, and topological insulators, and uh, also certain one-dimensional systems that I want to just very briefly talk about. Uh, and many of the other topics are probably uh, captured by, by some of the other lectures. And these uh, phases just, well, certainly they, they are phases that cannot be characterized by symmetry breaking, but in fact, they have some quite fascinating properties. So there's some quantized conductance, as in the quantum, quantum, quantum Hall effects. There's some effect of fractionalization, so meaning that we build a system out of certain entities. So like, for example, we just take electrons, build a two-dimensional electron gas, and then when applying the strong magnetic field and at low temperatures, the quantum Hall effect or the fractional quantum Hall effect is formed, which then has excitations that carry fractions of the elementary charge. So, uh, uh, and this is something I find quite fascinating that we just build something out of electrons and we find excitations that are fractions of these electrons. And again, this is just deeply linked to the fact that we have these kind of topological order. And another thing is that we have kind of protected or symmetry protected um, edge states that characterize these systems. So there's a lot of interesting physics that I'm not going to be able to cover in detail, but we can just briefly, kind of, uh, roughly kind of classify these different types into intrinsic phases that are very robust uh, to all sort of small perturbations. And we have the so-called symmetry protected topological phases that are only uh, protected or only um, robust as long as we play by certain rules, so as long as we uh, preserve certain symmetries. And I want to give now a, a brief idea of uh, how we can use matrix product states to understand these um, so-called Haldane spin chains. And this Haldane spin chain is, in fact, very closely related to the physics that we saw before in terms of this AKLT state. So we just saw this Hamiltonian before, but then we had this one-third times the biquadratic uh, um, um, spin term, which, um, which is absent here. But it turns out, and this was already to one of the questions, the physics at this point, at this AKLT point, or like this point where we have one-third here, and the one where we just leave out this term completely is, is roughly the same. So, and there's some quite interesting physics, and this was discovered by Haldane in the mid-80s or early 80s, um, where he found that when diagonalizing this Hamiltonian on a, uh, on a ring, say, we find that the system has a unique ground state 
protected by some energy gap uh, to some excitation continuum. So at this level, it just looks like a simple trivially uh, um, disorder, like, a, like a, just a simple power magnet. However, there's a surprise. The surprise is that if you look at this Hamiltonian not on a ring, but you look at this Hamiltonian on an open chain, you find that the ground state uh, all of a sudden is fourfold degenerate. And in fact, the AKLT state um, that we looked at before, like this uh, uh, form, you remember this um, state where we had the spin one side splitting up into two spin one half, which form mutually singlets, um, is an explanation for this. Because we find in the bulk, all the spins are forming, this, these kind of virtual spin one half forming singlets, except the two poor guys at the end of the chain, because they don't have anyone to form singlet with. So then we have basically two uncoupled spin one half degrees of freedom sitting at the boundary, and these form the fourfold degeneracy. Like each of the two spin one halves can point up or down, giving us the fourfold degeneracy. Good. And that by itself is something interesting because here we start off from something that's a spin one chain. So we have an integer spin chain. However, we have half integer uh, degrees of freedom sitting at the end of our our chain. So, so, so here we have some uh, fractionalized uh, edge excitations. And this is not pure fantasy, and in fact, it can be measured. So there are certain materials that, to a good approximation, are described by these uh, spin one chains. And it turns out, if you take one of these uh, um, um, compounds or materials and you just dope these systems with non-magnetic impurities, you just essentially creating an ensemble of open chains then in the um, uh, NMR profile, one can see actually signatures of, of the um, um, spin one half degrees of freedom. So and let me now briefly discuss a more general concept that describes these types of phases. Because it turns out that this Haldane phase is, uh, is just uh, one example of a, of a kind of big class of, of phases of meta. And these are the so-called symmetry protected topological phases. And uh, because of the lack of time, I just want to give you a brief idea of what this is, and then uh, you can see if you find this interesting or not. So let us now do the following. We just take our ground state, um, and we just cut out a segment out of this um, ground state, say. Uh, and using this MPS formalism, we could actually just say that, well, let us just take a bunch of these matrices um, out of our ground state. And then we can do the following. We just apply a symmetry operation to this um, segment that we have. And the, we do this by just applying a symmetry operation to each side. Let's say for our spin system, that could be just a local spin rotation. So we have uh, our Heisenberg Hamiltonian, which is invariant under spin rotations. So basically, if we just rotate all the spins by a certain angle, the Hamiltonian and the state are invariant under this kind of spin rotation. So, which means if we apply this kind of symmetry operation, it doesn't change the state at all in the bulk, because the bulk state is invariant under the symmetry. However, um, if we have degeneracies, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, kind of transformation can basically transform the degrees of freedom that we have at the edges. And in particular, we find uh, we are now looking at systems where the on-site representation uh, of the symmetry is a so-called linear representation, which means the multiplication rules for the uh, representation is the same as the one in the group. So UG times UH is times UGH. However, the presenta representation at the boundary can be a so-called projective representation. So a projective representation is actually known to mathematicians for more than 100 years. And the idea is that you just take a regular representation of your group, but you just add some phase, kind of some, some consistent set of, of phase factors to it. Uh, and we are all aware of projective representations if you just, for example, think about half integer spins. But if you just take a spin rotation symmetry and you just look at how it is re represented in terms of the Pauli matrices, you find that Pauli matrices anti-commute, so they actually have some non-trivial phase factors in here. So, and again, mathematicians have looked at these uh, projective representations for a long time, and in, 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 in a few words, what they, what they found, or like they, what's the question they ask, or like what Chur asked himself is the following. You just take a group, um, 
with certain generators, and then you just uh, write down two consistent uh, um, phase sets. So you just write down basically two projective representations. And the question you ask, uh, what kind of, like, if I just write down these two different projective representations, can I actually sort of transform one into the other or not? And then he found that, well, not necessarily. And in fact, he found there are different classes of projective representations, which are labeled by these uh, uh, cohomology groups. So, and it turns out that the same mechanism or the same ideas that were put forward by mathematicians a long time ago can be used to classify symmetry protected topological phases. And uh, this can now be um, applied exactly to, to, to this kind of model. And we could just say that, well, we just take this Heisenberg model where I already argued that this is in this particular phase where we have half integer degrees of freedom at the edge. And we add to it a so-called single ion anisotropy. So with a single ion anisotropy, we find the following. If you make uh, this d very large, then the, so, so, so if you let d go to infinity, then clearly all the ground states will be simple product states, where we have products of sz equals to zero eigenstates. And uh, uh, if d is zero, we are in this Haldane phase, or in this phase, in this AKLT type of um, phase. And as I argued, in this AKLT phase, we find that the boundaries actually have spin one halves. So we find here is the projective representation. And in the large D phase, we actually um, have just a simple product state of integer spins. So the boundaries are just uh, in a trivial representation. So we find that the uh, representations commute. And uh, this does, in fact, also uh, tie into some order parameters that can be some sort of non-local order parameters that can be basically measured in experiments. Good. Uh, but the, the main part that I want to, to make is that um, um, this, with a little bit of extra work that I unfortunately don't have the time to explain in detail, but so I'll refer to the notes, is that because of this DMRG language is exactly formulated in terms of those uh, uh, edges. So basically, we can just do, think of doing a Schmidt decomposition of a system, and it gives us, even in an infinite system, uh, access to some edges. We can, in fact, just uh, apply, basically, symmetry operations to those Schmidt states or to this matrix product states, and then directly read off this. So, in fact, this plot is done with a very short MPS code, and uh, uh, it's very convenient once we are in this language. Good. Yeah, sorry for this, uh, for being very brief on this, but I want to, uh, want to move on to uh, dynamics. <laughs> so, yeah? Uh, what? The previous slide, yeah. Uh, is it possible to take exponentially phi minus 1? How about exponentially? Okay, good. So, uh, if you, so, so by basically knowing how the edge degrees of freedom transform, we can make many uh, 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 predictions. So, and in particular, we can define so-called uh, string order parameters. And these string order parameters we can design in such a way that they are sensitive to what these phases are. So we can, uh, basically by having the knowledge of, uh, or maybe after having figured out that the symmetries uh, transform, or basically the, the representation of the symmetries in terms of these edge degrees of freedom is different in different phases. We can design uh, some observable kind of order parameters or like non-local order parameters, some string order parameters that can be measured. And in fact, this picture here is showing a measurement of some string order parameter in a cold, op a cold, like cold atomic uh, lattice. But again, here, I just want to mostly focus on this numerical or computational part. And there, it's uh, quite neat that if, if you have this matrix product state representation, we can more or less directly read off these uh, phases from, from the MPS. Good. So the first part, I, I focus on ground state properties. And I focus on uh, infinite systems. So how can we actually? Uh, of uh, 
efficiently represent ground states of infinite systems and how we can uh, work with them. So, so given that we have an MPS, how can we extract various observables? And unfortunately, only very briefly, I talked about how this can be helpful for uh, studying kind of new phases of meta. And there I refer to the, uh, to the notes where we find a little bit more on that. So let me now uh, come to dynamics. So I want to discuss in this part mainly how can we use matrix product states to study uh, dynamics in the form of uh, quench dynamics or calculate uh, dynamical correlation functions using uh, MPS. And for this, I want to discuss uh, mainly the so-called time-evolving block decimation algorithm, which is, a, I find, amazingly simple algorithm uh, that allows us to do the time evolution both in real time and in imaginary time. Uh, and in the tutorials, we're going to use this code uh, quite a bit to play with some, some different models. I'm going to then show some results obtained with this algorithm uh, discussing quench dynamics and how basically the entanglement grows. And this comes in also to uh, how, how efficient MPS uh, remain in these um, cases. And in the end, I want to talk about some very recent developments, namely a so-called uh, MPO-based uh, time evolution. Good. And if I would have more time than I expect, where well, I think it's probably not going to happen. Uh, then I can also talk a little bit of some very recent developments in the field of many-body localization and how we can actually use DMRG on excited states. Good. How to simulate uh, the time evolution of MPS? So the, the simple question that we're asking is the following. So we have a matrix product state given at time zero, and we want to just evolve it uh, by a certain amount of, of time, and uh, assuming that uh, psi is, is not an eigenstate of the system. So, and there, over the, uh, over the, the past years, there have been uh, several algorithms uh, proposed, and many of them are very closely related to each other. So the first one, and this is the one that I'm going to discuss in detail, is the time-evolving uh, block decimation. And this, I think, is a very neat and extremely compact algorithm that uh, 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 and that I want to discuss. There's a so-called uh, time-dependent DMRG, which is uh, very closely related to, this, uh, to the first one, except that uh, certain updates are done in a, in a somewhat different way. There are sort of uh, Krylov space methods, which uh, are different in that they act by applying a Hamiltonian globally to the system, uh, but then it has the drawback that it um, has an error, like the scaling of the error is, is scaling uh, not so uh, nicely. And there are some recent developments, which is called time-dependent variational principle, which uh, seems to be a very powerful method, but has been not explored so much. And there's a last method that I, uh, again, want to talk a bit about more details, the so-called matrix product operator-based uh, time evolution, which is, again, a very simple idea, namely, it just uh, takes a time evolution operator and it just gives you a recipe how you can write down. So given that you have an MPO, a matrix product operator of, of a Hamiltonian, how, how you can actually write down the exponential of this operator again as a uh, matrix product operator. Good. So let me start by discussing or by introducing in a bit more detail this uh, time-evolving block decimation algorithm. So we assume now the following. So we assume that our Hamiltonian has this simple form. So it's just uh, the sum of some local terms kind of coupling neighboring sites. Right? So basically all the models that I've shown so far would fall into this class. So we just had uh, terms which are SI, SI plus 1, and... Uh, the problem is that if you want to have systems where you have uh, also a term uh, uh, SI, SI plus 2, applying this method would actually imply that you have to group sites. So you can just basically enlarge the unit cell, and then you can again rewrite the Hamiltonian in this form. So 
then you'd actually just uh, have to pay the price of having a larger local Hilbert space dimension, but you can still um, write it in this form. Good, so let us now look at uh, Hamiltonians that have this form. And what I want to demonstrate is a, a, a tool or some, some, some algorithm that allows us to uh, do the time evolution in, in real time and in imaginary time. In imaginary time, we just are interested in this algorithm because doing imaginary time evolution allows us to find the, the ground state wave function. Is it clear to everyone why doing the uh, time evolution in imaginary time is giving us the ground state if we just do it for long enough? I assume so. I mean, the, the way if you want to sit down and just show it by itself, you can say that, well, let us just take the state psi and expand it in terms of eigenfunction of h. And then we see that uh, by applying the imaginary time evolution, uh, states that correspond to excited states will be exponentially suppressed in this uh, superpositions. So uh, by normalizing it again, we will actually find that eventually it's only the ground state that's uh, left. And also, from this explanation that I just gave, you actually see that there are particular cases where this will perform very poorly, and this is when the gap between the ground state and the lowest excitations is very small because then this is converging very slowly. And it works extremely well if there's a large gap between the ground state and the first excited states. Good. So let us now consider uh, this type of Hamiltonian and do a uh, decomposition of the Hamiltonian. Let me just describe this. So we have our uh, one-dimensional system. And the terms of H act, of course, on all bonds. Right? However, now we just do a decomposition of this Hamiltonian into a term uh, F. F is only acting, say, on the even bond. So F is acting only here, here, and here. And G acts only on the odd bond. Um, why is this useful to do this uh, decomposition? It's because we find that now, if I just uh, do this splitting of my Hamiltonian, all terms f commute, because they don't have any sites in, in common. And also, all sites in, uh, these are the f terms and these are the g terms, all terms in uh, g also commute. However, F and G do not commute because they um, overlap. So having made this observation, we can actually uh, use the so-called uh, Suzuki-Trotter decomposition, which means we just uh, write our Hamiltonian, like uh, uh, e to the minus i times f plus g times delta t. So this amounts to doing a time evolution with our Hamiltonian by time step uh, uh, delta t. And we just expand it uh, as a, uh, 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 like, like, like this is kind of um, trotter decomposition. And to lowest order, we just say that um, we just take the um, product of x and uh, y. And this is uh, then an approximation which is good up to, to first order. So, so basically, we find that if you if we have exponential of, uh, uh, let's say, minus i times f plus g times delta t, and this is equal to uh, the exponential minus i times f times delta times exponential minus f times delta uh, plus some corrections in order delta squared. So the way that we can see these corrections is just by applying a Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff. And then we um, see that these, um, these, so we only have corrections up to uh, order uh, delta squared. So if we make delta 
small enough, we see that we can at some point just neglect these uh, corrections. So, and by doing this decomposition, what have we uh, achieved now? So, we find that um, in this term and this term, the uh, um, all terms just simply um, commute. So we can say that, well, this term is actually equal to just the product over all uh, j, say, even of uh, the exponential minus i f times delta, uh, like f, say, j, and this is equal to the product of j odd of the exponential of minus i. Oops, there should be a g here, right? Sorry about that. Uh, minus g j times delta. Okay, I think this is probably clear. So what we have achieved now is that we can just uh, write down our time evolution as just a simple product of uh, these kind of two side gates, or like operators that act only on two neighboring sides, uh, on the, first on the even bonds, then we just do this on the odd bonds, and by just doing this successively, we are guaranteed to have done this correctly up to order delta squared. So, going back to MPS, um, now we can just do exactly what, uh, what, what I've demonstrated here, and just apply this to an MPS. Uh, and this is what we want to discuss in a lot of detail now. So what we have now is the following. To say that we have our matrix product state, again, given in this canonical form. Right? So we have this canonical form here, here defined for a finite system, where we again assume all these identities that we derived in the first part of the uh, uh, lecture. And now we just apply these uh, two side gates to it. And when I draw this picture here, this U, this is in fact just uh, uh, the exponential of, say, uh, minus i minus i delta uh, h, say, i, i plus 1. Right? So we just apply the Hamiltonian to, uh, to two neighboring uh, sites. And if I just write this like, like this is like a technicality, but if I just uh, do this, for example, for a spin one-half system, then I find that um, this object is just uh, basically corresponds to a four by four matrix or a two by two by two tensor. Okay. All I'm doing here is basically just translating what I said before in terms of the uh, product of these gates in terms of the language of matrix product states. So, so this is what we want to do to kind of apply half this trotter gate to our uh, state. What do we need to do now? So, so now we just take our MPS and we just apply to it these gates. And by this, we clearly are uh, not having this MPS form because now if we just contract all these indices together, we have like these big blobs and uh, this is no longer an efficient representation if we just keep going. But what we want to do, and this is what uh, the, this kind of uh, TBD algorithm will do for us, is we want to uh, apply this product of gates and then return to our original MPS form. And this is what we uh, will discuss now. So in, in short, because we can do this now for each bond individually. So, sorry, let me go back. So when we do this, we could say that, well, let us just start here with the first bond, do this, find it back, and then go to the next bond, find it, and so on and so forth. So if we figure out how to do this for one bond, so how can we start from this object and return to a new MPS, then we can declare victory and we have an algorithm. And I want to show 
uh, go go with you th kind of carefully to these um, steps of the algorithm now. So. So the first step is that we need to apply uh, U. And uh, the idea is that we first construct our object theta. And theta, we can just uh, contract all together. And then we find it's just like this. So we have lambda, say, A, gamma, B, lambda, B, gamma, C, uh, lambda, C. And just, and, and then we have here, say, the index alpha, gamma, uh, M, and N, M, N, alpha, and gamma. So now connecting it again to what we did in the previous lecture, because I was saying that, well, we're assuming that we have this particular canonical form, which means if I just contract my MPS in this form, I actually get my, my wave function at this point in a particular representation, namely in this so-called mixed representation. So that means I can just write down my these kind of objects, these, uh, which we can call like uh, M, N, alpha, gamma times alpha, say left, M, N, gamma, right. So we have our one-dimensional system. And we say that, well, we just focus on these two sides. Everything left of these two sides is described by Schmidt states alpha. And everything on the right is described by Schmidt states gamma. And the local sites are described by M and N. Right? So what we did here is, well, we have this canonical form. And then if we just contract a bunch of these matrices, we actually get the wave function in a representation, in a mixed representation of Schmidt states and uh, local basis states. And now we can say that, well, we just take our um, object theta here, and we just do a time evolution of our wave function. And since we just sort of unpacked the uh, indices mn, we can just easily apply the time evolution operator to those. So we find our uh, uh, theta tilde, which is a time evolved uh, wave function, is just the one where we contract these tensors uh, together. OK, so this is our u. This is the theta. OK, so what we have achieved now is that we just did a time evolution of, uh, of the wave function by one bit on, on one bond. And now we have obtained the, um, the, kind of the, the new wave function, and we want to uh, slightly going back to the original representation. And re, re, you recall that the MPS in this canonical form is giving in this way that the bond indices always correspond simply to the um, Schmidt decomposition at a given bond. So what we can do is we can just say that, well, we just uh, take our, our wave function, like uh, our theta. I mean, this is now step number two. We take our um, wave function in this form, our theta form, like alpha m uh, gamma n. And we just regroup, basically, the indices. So we just say that, well, this is a, a matrix where we have just indices. You can just put maybe theta alpha m comma uh, gamma n. So now this is just a. Um, a, a, a matrix, a, a matrix 
with the dimension of chi, chi being the matrix dimension times d, comma chi times d. And this matrix is now, like, in this representation, we actually describe the one-dimensional system uh, for this bond again. So everything left of this bond is described by a basis uh, alpha m, and everything here is described by gamma n. So what we can do is now we just take this object and do a uh, singular value decomposition of our oops, of our theta tilde. So we say that SVD, so we have the SVD of our theta, where we just group alpha m comma gamma n is equal to uh, the sum from beta from 1 to uh, d times chi of, and uh, now we have x alpha m beta times lambda beta times, say, y beta uh, n gamma. Okay, you see, so what I did now is I just take my uh, uh, theta tilde and I do a, a singular value decomposition of this object into like unitary matrices in this diagonal matrix lambda. And these are exactly the, the Schmidt values for a decomposition of our state at, at this bond here. Good. So uh, graphically, what we have done is we just say that, well, we have our, our um, theta tilde uh, blob, basically, and we now uh, write it as a, uh, as a product so to say, of lambda x and y. Right? So this one here is the x, and we have like this index uh, alpha and m, and the index beta, lambda beta, y beta, and then we have n gamma. So we can just uh, un unpack it. And this brings us already to uh, step number three, because now um, we are almost there, <laughs> because this um, we can now just insert identities and get back the um, the new new MPS. And this we do in the following way: we just take our object here, so where we have x. Uh, Lambda. Let me just. Oh, sorry. So this is already the the new lambda. This is so I give it a lambda tilde because here we had lambda. So we have here our lambda tilde, and we have y. And now we can basically insert here the identity. So we just insert here uh, lambda times lambda to the minus one. And here we have a lambda minus 1 times lambda. These are now the original lambdas that were at this particular bond. And then we find that our kind of gamma tilde uh, A, so this is the one that we got here, is just uh, equal to lambda a uh, minus 1 times x, basically using it like this, and our gamma c, oh, sorry, this is actually b, c is equal to our y, times lambda c minus 1. 
and the uh, gamma uh, lambda uh, b is just automatically given from this Schmidt decomposition. Okay, so we have now obtained new, so we just have our wave function in this mixed representation, and then we do a Schmidt decomposition of this mixed representation, and this gives us access immediately to the new Schmidt values that we have on this particular bond. So we already have the new lambda matrix, and we get these uh, unitaries for the left and for the right, and from them, just by inserting this identity, we can get back our updated uh, uh, gamma matrices. So, so we can almost uh, declare victory. We are almost um, there. So we are back to this particular form. However, we find that during this uh, procedure, we started off from a bond on which the bond dimension was chi. So we originally we had here chi, like the, 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 the bond dimension chi of the original MPS. And now, because we um, uh, added this kind of local sites, the bond dimension has now increased to uh, d times chi. Right? Because when I have this um, sum in this singular value decomposition, we have uh, d times chi states. So after each iteration, the bond dimension would increase, and that would actually mean that the bond dimension is uh, increasing exponentially as we go along, and there's a time evolution. So we have this important uh, truncation step, and that actually uh, sets in here. When we uh, do the singular value decomposition, we just uh, could, we will get a picture roughly like this. We have here some index alpha, and we have lambda alpha tilde, so they will decay very rapidly. And then we can just say after each update step that we only keep maybe that many states, and then we just truncate it basically back to, to chi or to some value that we think is reasonable. Good. So this is the uh, uh, simple TBD algorithm. Is this, from this explanation, clear how this algorithm works? Or are there questions to how to implement this algorithm? Okay, I take that this is relatively clear then. So, and so far I assumed that the uh, system was not necessarily a translation invariant. So I assume that all matrices could, in principle, be, be different. And there's actually a very simple insight that this method also works for uh, uh, um, infinite systems. And there the, the idea is the following. So we just assume that we start from a state that this is, uh, that is translation invariant. But we assume uh, a unit cell. We say that we have uh, just two different types of matrices. So we have the, the A sites and B sites. And they, all A sites and all B sites are equivalent. And uh, then if we start from uh, this kind of state, we would find that this form is always uh, maintained. So the idea is the following. We So we have our infinite matrix product state that's going on forever. And now we have just gamma A, lambda A, gamma B, lambda B, gamma A, lambda B, gamma A, lambda A, B, and so on. And when we're doing our update step on, on this bond here, uh, we get some new uh, lambda A and uh, lambda B, uh, gamma A and gamma B and lambda A uh, tilde back. But we would find it's exactly the same as here and exactly the same as here. So, uh, so, so, so if we start from a state that it has this particular AB pattern, we will get back a state that has, again, the same uh, kind of symmetry. 
Uh, so instead of kind of applying this an, an infinite number of time, we can just apply it once and just realize that the same is happening, happening everywhere else. And then we do the, um, um, the odd bonds. And again, the same reasoning applies. We just do the same, like the same thing is happening on all bonds. So instead of doing this an infinite number of time, we just have to do it once and just know that the same is happening everywhere else. And what this means in practice, we just need to store two sets of matrices, like the uh, gamma A, lambda A, and gamma B, and uh, lambda B, and then just apply alternatingly updates between uh, A bonds and B bonds, and then go back to A bonds and B bonds. And this will actually do all these updates in, in parallel. And this algorithm I want to discuss now in uh, a bit of detail. And uh, I saw in the program that all of you are already Python experts, so we can uh, just jump right in. And uh, I want to uh, advertise actually that Python uh, actually provides some very powerful tool that basically allows us directly to uh, translate these drawings in the way that I like to present them into, uh, into Python code. And there are some very powerful tools to do so. So the first function that I want to advertise here is uh, called tensor dot. And tensor dot, what it does, it just takes two tensors and just contracts a certain number of uh, indices. So for example, I have here two tensors, one uh, Y and Z. Like Y is a rank two tensor, so it's just a matrix, and Z is a rank three tensor. So now I can do a uh, tensor contraction so that I just pick the, uh, uh, this index here, this M index, and I just contract over them. And it's uh, the first index, like, or like this is index zero, this is index one, so I now contract this index here with the zeros index of this object. Okay, so if I just draw this in my, my picture language, it would say that, well, we have some tensor X, and X is a rank three tensor, um, is equal to, and now we have uh, two tensors, so we have tensor Y, this is a rank two tensor, and we just contract it with a tensor Z, which is a rank three tensor. And you see, just from stuff that's shown here, the entire algorithm consists of uh, operations like this, where we just uh, contract these uh, matrices and tensors. OK, that's very important. Then there's another operation that we, yes? Also contract uh, more than one index at once. This is very correct, yes, and I didn't show it. Uh, so let us assume that we um, want to do something more complicated. Let us just say that we. Uh, had another index sticking out here, and we want to contract it with um, this index here. <laughs> so then the expression would look like this. So we have then x equal to uh, np dot tensor dot, and then we have x, no, uh, y, z, and then x is equal to, and now we have a, a, a list of different indices, which would be, for example, I don't know, just making up some, so we could have, for example, 1 and 2 contracting with 0 and 1. So you can just uh, put a list of indices that you want to contract over. Thanks. This, again, will be important also. Good, so, so this is for tensor contractions, but then sometimes we have to do these reshape uh, um, stuff, which is, for example, here, when we had this um, theta matrix, which is here a rank four tensor, and we want to reshape it into a rank two matrix, right? So we first had a uh, kind of chi times D times D times chi tensor, and we want to convert it into a D times chi, comma, uh, uh, kind of chi times D um, matrix. And this can be done by using the so-called uh, uh, reshape uh, 
reshape command. So we can just, uh, uh, um, so here, for example, we had a rank three tensor, and the dimension, like the, the dimension of this I index is dim one, dim two, and D three, and now we can just uh, reshape it into a matrix here. This is, again, very useful to do this kind of stuff. Lastly, I want to point out here the transpose command, which we can use just to change the order of uh, indices. And it's particularly useful in combination with this, uh, 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 with this regrouping, uh, with this um, reshaping. Because so say that you have an object, which we call, I don't know, if, if maybe the, the theta that you had had a form of i, j, alpha, gamma, but you want to reshape it to a, uh, to a matrix of, of this form, you first want to reshuffle the indices maybe to alpha, i, uh, gamma, j, and then you can just use this reshape command to just transform it to a uh, matrix. So this is one of the uh, cases where this uh, reshaping will be quite, quite useful. Good. So we can apply these ideas uh, and write the um, code. I don't know, is it at all readable from? Because then I could actually uh, go through this, which I find, at least when I wrote it the first time, I quite amazing because I first, when I started off thinking about DMRG, I thought this is always very complicated. But this is the entire TBD code that you need to write in, in Python without using any fancy libraries. It's just using standard uh, numerical Python. And uh, let me just go through this um, code. And because this is also what will be part of the tutorial where you will be able to, to play with this yourself. So this is actually the, uh, the program doing uh, time of, or imaginary time evolution on a transverse field Ising model. So we define first the parameters, so uh, the coupling, the transverse field, chi, chi being the maximum that bond dimension, De delta, this is the imaginary time step, and n is just defining how many steps we want to go. And then it just initializes the, uh, the vectors with some random numbers. And note that having these random numbers, it's not in this canonical form, but it turns out that during the course of the algorithm, the code is automatically transforming it into this canonical form. So this is just initializing the um, MPS. So it's just getting something ready of this form here. Now we need the, uh, the, 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 these two side gates. And they can be done, they are these produced in these two lines. So we first, uh, this I've done by hand, I just write down the uh, Ising Hamiltonian defined on two sides. So we have just the, uh, uh, for these two sides, I just define a local basis, which is just, uh, So on, on each side, we have the local basis, like J, Jn is basically just uh, up and down. And now I define the bond matrix, the bond Hamiltonian. So the bond Hamiltonian is using a basis where we have just up, 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 down, down, up, and down, down. And in this basis, we represent the Hamiltonian. You can see this already for the uh, coupling J. So the J is a diagonal on this matrix, and it's plus one for this one and this one, and it's minus one for this one and this one. And then if you just look a bit closer, you are like longer at it, you actually see that the, uh, uh, in the transverse field Ising model, the transverse field is just flipping the spin, and then you see that the flipping of the spin is just connecting particular of those configurations. So, so this line has given us the Hamiltonian, and then I can just use a built-in command to just e exponentiate this Hamiltonian. So just take e to the bond Hamiltonian. This already gives us the uh, two-side gate. Good. Equipped with this two-side gate and some initial MPS, we can then start the iteration. And this is now exactly following this simple protocol. So we first alternate between A bonds and B bonds. So we just have A and B is just like the modulus of the step that we have. 
And then we just construct this um, theta blob here, and which is done just by successively applying these uh, tensor dot operations. So we have uh, L is being the lambdas, and G is the gammas. And then we see that while we first apply the, uh, like if just do this in this this picture, we first take on an uh, like the B, the lambda B, and we take a gamma uh, A, and then this is the first index. Uh, this is uh, like index zero, one, and here we have index zero, one, and two. And then we see that we just uh, contract index one and one, and this gives us the first building block. And then we just keep going till we have contracted all of those guys. And this gives us then uh, um, this theta. Then we apply u to this um, theta block, which is done here. Now we just, as uh, advertised, we just apply a series of transpose and reshape operations to get it to this matrix form, like the one shown here. And all that's left to do is then to do an uh, SVD. So we just use a built-in function of the SVD. This returns the singular values for this particular uh, decomposition into two half chains. And then all that's left to do is to uh, just update the lambda. So the new lambdas just give us, uh, just basically written, we just take the, um, the singular values. We just renormalize it because we're doing imaginary time evolution. So the norm, the state needs to be renormalized at each step. So we just divide by the norm. And lastly, we just obtain the new uh, gamma and lambda uh, tensors. And then we just iterate it um, till we are um, done or converged uh, um, to something. So again, and this is something that you will have uh, a lot of chance to, to play with um, tomorrow and uh, try to use it to uh, figure out a few things about the Ising model. But let me now come back to uh, that we can to, to the dynamics in in these systems and just show what we can do if we have this kind of uh, code. <laughs> so first of all, what we can do is we can use either DMRG or we can use uh, TBD uh, with imaginary time evolution and find the ground state of of some Hamiltonian. Here, for example, found the ground state of the spin one Heisenberg model. Uh, so, so that can be done fairly easily. And then what I'm going to do is I just take the ground state. Um, so, so in this protocol, we just have our, so we have the MPS given of the ground state. And now I just apply to the ground state an operator S, S plus uh, to a given site. And then we can just, while well, before it was an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, once I applied S plus, it's no longer an eigenstate, and we can just study um, the time evolution. And then we can just create movies like this with the uh, ITBD uh, movie. So here we see we created the spin excitations in a spin one chain, and we see actually how the, uh, uh, how the spin excitation propagates. And in fact, well, while this is uh, just nice to look at, we can actually do use this data that I just uh, showed to obtain the dynamical structure factor. And uh, this is actually um, quite quite useful. Let me just uh, show how to do this in how we get the structure factor in uh, 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 quite nicely. So this is quite easy. So in order to calculate the um, dynamical structure factor, we first want to calculate the uh, time dependent correlation functions. So, and uh, these ones are given the following. We just take our ground state in terms of the MPS, and now we apply to this sum operator uh, O, O, uh, I don't know, O1 to it at time T, and we apply an operator O2 at uh, time equals to zero. And now uh, we can just plug in the time evolution. We, we can just plug in the, the Heisenberg picture of these operators. So we have e to the uh, 
i t h times operator o one times e to the minus i t h times operator o two applied to the ground state. But now we see that the state that we started from is actually uh, this is an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. So this is actually just uh, e to the i t times e naught. So this just gives us a phase factor times psi naught uh, like O1 times e to the minus i t h uh, times psi naught 2. So all we need to do is we just uh, create our initial state and we apply some operator to it. So we just time evolve it and then overlap it with the uh, with some other state. So this is something that we can do fairly uh, easily by just time evolving a single state. And if we have uh, uh, obtained this, we can just get quantities such as the dynamical structure factor, which is uh, relevant for several experiments, such as uh, neutron scattering or uh, uh, ARPIS for electronic systems, etc., where we just look at how a local excitation is basically uh, uh, affecting the system. And the dynamical structure factor is just the Fourier transform of such a, a, a dynamical, like a, a time dependent correlation function. So here we just flip the spin on side zero at time zero, and then we let the system propagate, and then we just uh, uh, flip it again back on side uh, x at time t. Right? So we just look at correlations along this. Uh, time and uh, space plane. And doing a, time of, uh, doing a Fourier transform of this object, we find uh, the dynamical structure factor, S of k and omega. And this is what we can use to study uh, very systems here. If we, for example, calculate this for a spin one Heisenberg model, uh, we see, we can, for example, here see the so-called Haldane gap. So we see that the gap, we see where in momentum space the um, uh, the, 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 the minimum is. And if you look at transitions, we can actually see at what momenta we find the gapless modes, etc. So this is quite insightful for systems. And here we have a spin two, spin one half letter, and then we see like some broad structure, which are indicative for some fractionalized excitations, and etc. So this is a quite neat tool to uh, study uh, uh, kind of dynamical properties of, of spin systems. And it can be done fairly easily with this um, simple code that I just showed uh, a minute ago. Let me now go to uh, something where the um, uh, where we quickly reach the, the boundaries of what we can simulate, and this is uh, in terms of quenches. So, and here I just want to just provide some intuition for it. So, the the entire argument uh, um, was was based on on the area law. I said that well. Ground states of local Hamiltonians are very, very little entangled, so we can efficiently represent them by just uh, compressing the states. So we just have only little uh, entanglement, like only few local excitations, local kind of uh, fluctuations in the wave function. So it turns out that this breaks down pretty quickly when we go to uh, when we look at uh, non-equilibrium, when we look at uh, systems out of, out of equilibrium, and. Uh, and that's what I want to demonstrate here. Let us just assume that we uh, have, say, uh, just a Heisenberg model, and we start from a simple product state. So we just initialize our system with a product state, which has actually a zero entanglement, clearly. And now we just uh, do the time evolution of the system by just evolving it with a Heisenberg model, say. And now we can look at the entanglement between two half chains. So we just look. Again, how are the left and the right part of our, our system uh, entangled? And this will be exactly directly um, uh, related to the bond dimension that we need. Right? We call that this is exactly how we argued MPS are good by just doing a bipartition of a system into two two half chains and see can we get away with it by or can we get away with truncating this Schmidt decomposition. So 
And it turns out that the uh, entanglement following this kind of local quench will grow uh, linearly with time. And uh, the, uh, the argument for this is basically provided by a number of papers, but we can just understand it in this way. So we start from a product state where we say that we just have, uh, just have this kind of state in mind. Now we evolve it in time. And it turns out the ground state has lots of uh, like a high density of local excitations. So basically, the Hamiltonian is not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. And now, as time progresses, these excitations, they spread over the system. And whenever one of these kind of light cones from one of these excitations crosses the, the cut, the system becomes entangled. Right? So maybe it's easiest to think of really literally in terms of particles. If you have a particle sitting here at time 0, the probability of this particle is, is one to be on the left side of this chain. But it, as time progresses, at some point, like after this light cone crossed this cut, then there's a finite the probability of finding the particle on the left or on the right. So there's some uncertainty. So the system becomes entangled. And the light cones that cross this cut is actually increasing linearly as a function of time, right? Like more and more line clones um, cross this cut, so we get this uh, linear entanglement growth. And that's really bad news for these matrix product state type of methods, because if the entanglement grows linearly, we know that the bond dimension needed to express these states is increasing exponentially. Right? So the, um, so while starting with a state that basically has zero entanglement, we very quickly arrive at a state that has a very high entanglement. And that means that we are very quickly sort of leaving this uh, comfort zone that we enjoyed when doing matrix product state simulations. In fact, well, find the ground state is in this tiny corner that has an area law. If we start from this, we do a global quench, so we just add a finite density of defects, we very quickly um, run out of this uh, zone and get into states with high entanglement. And these states can then uh, basically not or only um, uh, with a lot of effort be, be simulated. And just as a, as a remark, when I started playing with these time uh, with time illusion of MPS, I just uh, did these kind of quench experiments that you're also going to do tomorrow in the, in the session. And then it turns out you can do a time evolution up to time maybe 10 or so on your laptop in a few minutes. But just going to 12 or maybe 13 would require a supercomputer. It's just like the, because of this exponential growth, it's, uh, it's getting so much more difficult uh, when just only trying to push it by a few more steps. So, this is something that you hopefully uh, experience uh, tomorrow. Good. Um, let me now, for the remaining few minutes, discuss about some, some recent uh, developments. Because the, uh, for especially since, since now we are more and more interested in using MPS also for simulating two-dimensional systems, I mean, using this kind of snake uh, technique, which has been very successful for doing ground state DMRG, we are now quite interested in also applying these ideas to, to do time evolution. However, this sort of standard method that I introduced, this uh, TBD algorithm, can't cope with this. I mean, because for this TBD, at least if you're just directly applying it, we would have the problem that the, in this one-dimensional language, the, um, the coupling become longer and longer range. Right? So as we make, if we just enumerate these sites from, uh, I, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, et cetera, then we see that we have, uh, even though the original model in the two-dimensional system was short range, uh, in this one-dimensional representation, we suddenly have a coupling between site number one and site number eight. So which means that these Trotter-based uh, algorithm can't really uh, be applied to, to these kind of problems, unless one is just reshuffling the sites for every step. But that becomes quite costly. 
And secondly, we like to have methods that can actually be applied to these infinitely long systems because then we don't have to deal with these boundary effects, etc. Um, and we want to have something that is relatively easy, easily implemented. And uh, now I want to just introduce briefly a, a method that sort of uh, does all of this. And uh, the method also kind of is based on a rather simple idea. So if you want to, if you have uh, a Hamiltonian that's expressed as a sum of terms, like just the sum over hx, and these hx can actually span over multi, like over longer ranges. Um, now we want to look at an, an expansion of e to the minus t times h for a small t. And the, the simplest thing that we can do is we can just do some, uh, some, some expansion of uh, 1 plus t times the sum of all these x. So this is just the expansion of the, um, uh, of, of, of the exponential. But what we can do is we can actually go from this kind of uh, global stepper to a local one, where we just have the product of 1 plus t times hx. So this is, again, just an approximation. But the um, advantage is that while in this term we apply the Hamiltonian globally to the state, we find that the error is actually scaling exp um, quadratically with L. While if we do this local step, it's still an approximation of first order. However, the, um, the error will actually scale only linearly with the length of a system or the number of sites. So in other words, if we're doing this kind of approximation, we have an, a constant error per site, while here we have an error that is scaling linearly with uh, the system size. So, and the very neat observation that one can make is that if you are using, uh, you're approximating this term just as the um, uh, sum of non non-overlapping uh, terms, so we just neglect terms in which these uh, hx um, overlap, then this has a very nice um, matrix product state representation. So we can actually, um, if you have an Hamiltonian given as a, a matrix product operator, we can just uh, find the representation of this approximation of e to that Hamiltonian fairly easily. And, uh, in fact, all you need to do is, if you have an uh, MPO, which for experts of matrix product operators can be represented in this kind of uh, finite state machine form, which I don't want to go into detail, but there is a particular way that we can understand matrix product operators. We just can uh, change it a little bit in that instead of going basically from the initial state to the final state, we go back from, we start from the initial state and eventually go back to the initial state. And so it turns out if we have a d-dimensional Hamiltonian MPO, we can just write it an d minus one-dimensional time evolution MPO. So that's a quite uh, neat um, method. So we can then try it out and compare it to the uh, kind of uh, simple TBD algorithm, and we find that it, uh, in terms of the error for uh, a short-range Hamiltonian, it, the error scales basically um, very comparable to, to uh, TBD. But then we can actually go beyond it. So we can look at uh, Hamiltonians that actually have long-range interactions, such as this holdrain shastri model, where we can just uh, do a, a quench of the system, which we can't do with this TBD very easily. And we can also look at the expansion of uh, bosonic clouds. And this is something that uh, Johannes Hauschild has actually a paper on where he applied this algorithm to look at uh, how bosonic clouds in two-dimensional lattices uh, expand. And this is something that was not really possible to do before with these standard algorithms. Good. Uh, again, I think regarding time, I'm not making it to the last part, really. So maybe it would be best if we discuss some questions, if there are some. Yes? So you mentioned this, um, so what is lower branch? So I understand a bit. So if we would apply to Amazonia, the ground state of um, this product state, like an arbitrary state, 
Mm -hmm. Right. If you right, if you are quenching, if you have a state and you just evolve it with the Hamiltonian to which this is an eigenstate. Yes, except that you also have the other case, which is like the global uh, rotation of both states. So you have only two, two states. I'm not quite sure. I'm following. I mean, if you evolve an eigenstate, clearly nothing is going to happen. Because then the state is is, is, is is an eigenstate. If you say that you're taking a superposition of two eigenstates, of you just have a symmetry broken system, and you just evolve that superposition, it's still an eigenstate. So it still wouldn't evolve. Yes? Yeah? Uh, how do you think how this is? You're talking about the primary case. Why are you trying to talk about it? For which one? For the Hadrian's chain power. For Holdane? Uh, you mean in, in this one here? Well, here I actually, um, I mean, what I actually did, I, I simulate uh, an infinite system with a large unit cell. And then I just do a quench in the middle. But on this kind of plot, you wouldn't be able to tell if this is a finite or an infinite system. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, this trick that I was just putting forward where we say that we are, uh, yeah, so this is actually a good question. So when I'm looking at this infinite system where I just say that my entire state is just built from this pattern A, B, A, B, then I could not do something like this here because here I'm clearly breaking the translation invariance of my infinite system because I just have a state and now I apply the uh, sigma plus operator to one state. So here, like to do plots of, of this type, I would have a, either an algorithm which is infinite, but it has a unit cell of several hundred spins, or I just do a system with open boundary conditions. But for these kind of, if I just study the global quench, for example, then I'm just keeping the translation invariant, so then I can just use this A-B pattern. Oh, for the topological order thing, okay. So for the topological order thing, which unfortunately I didn't uh, get into too much detail, there the idea is that I can actually read off everything by just looking at an infinite system. And the idea there is because what well, the defining property of those SBT phases is actually um, the, the edge physics. However, if I just take my MPS, which is defined for an infinite system, I just variationally optimize this MPS. But now what I can do is I can actually say that, well, I actually just uh, cut the MPS open. So I just basically look at only the half chain of the MPS by only, say, multiplying the matrices uh, right of this chain. And then I get exactly these Schmidt states, right? So, so this is what I advertised in the first lecture, that if you're having this canonical form, you have a direct access to the Schmidt states for a bipartition of a system. And then the idea how to extract all these defining properties is to look at the Schmidt states. So you just basically consider Schmidt states as some uh, virtual or artificial cuts in the system that you can use to study the uh, um, edge physics. Well, it means that in, in this case, my, my system is infinite. So the parity of. Uh, well, no, this, you mean, you have to distinguish two things. I mean, this uh, A, B pattern is basically just for the algorithm. It's just because the algorithm, in the course of, because I have my uh, A and then I have my B gates. This is what requires to have at least two sites in my unit cell. This is just a technicality for the algorithm. But if I'm analyzing the topological properties of my state, that will not be important. The 
precise idea how to extract topological order or how to extract these topological properties from the uh, MPS is a bit involved, so I'm probably not, act but I'm happy to explain this in, in detail to you. Yes. Well, not in general, but for these uh, time evolution. So I just, what I'm saying here is that, uh, what I'm saying is, you have you have this time evolution operator. If t is very small, we can approximate the uh, time evolution in this form here by just neglecting the non-overlapping by neglecting the overlapping terms, and it, it turns out. This expression has a very compact matrix product operator representation. And in fact, if you already have an existing code that creates a uh, matrix product operator form of H, you can just uh, reorder basically the blocks, and then you get automatically this one. It's yes, exactly. So if you have an MPO of H, you can just write down an MPO. If you have an MPO for the sum over HX, it's easy to obtain an MPO for, for this expression here. Okay, so how does the bound dimension of the MPO grow? It actually shrinks. If, you have, if the MPO of this expression is D, the MPO of this dimension is D minus 1. And this comes from the fact that you just take the same MPO except and this is what I, again, find a bit long to explain, but there's this interpretation of the MPO as a finite state machine. I mean, the finite state machine is what you usually maybe think of displaying, understanding some automata. So you just say that you toss in a coin, it goes into the accept coin state, la, la, la. And the same, and we can have the same view of an MPO. So the MPO is maybe at some point going into the step of placed an operator X, and then placing an operator Y, and then it's going to the final state that is basically done doing anything. And the thing is, like, this is like how you define the original Hamiltonian. If you now, instead of going from the final state, going to the final state, you go back to the initial state. This is, uh, you just basically reprogram your finite state machine. And then you just go from a D dimension MPO to a D minus one dimension MPO. Yeah? How do I measure ex entanglement in numerics or in in real world? Hmm? Well, I think this is so far mostly an open question. I mean, there are some proposals how you can measure certain Renyi entropies. I mean, Renyi entropies being entropies that you can uh, get by taking uh, certain powers of the reduced density matrix. There are some proposals. I don't know how much they actually are. Uh, would work. But I think this is mostly still an open question. You, one thing, I mean, you can measure some particle number fluctuations which give some lower moments of the entanglement entropy, but, but really the entanglement, I don't, I'm not aware of any experiment that successfully um, measures the entanglement entropy. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, if there are no further questions, then uh, thank you for your attention and I uh, hope to see you tomorrow for the tutorial where we can explore all this. Uh